Okay, so it is uh, five after the hour, and we're on to our next uh, presentation. And uh, our next speaker is Maro Zapatera, and he will be speaking on our breath. Uh, Mauro is a medical doctor. His degrees are from Harvard Medical School. Uh, he's board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation with a focus on optimizing human performance, increasing awareness, and decreasing suffering. He's been practicing mindfulness uh, since 1998 and teaching it to patients with chronic pain since 2018. He leads the Awakening Awareness Program, which I think is a weekly program through the Emerging Sciences Foundation. He has also published a number of scientific papers and medical book chapters on the cerebrospinal fluid, disability, pain management, and also published uh, I Am, All One, and All Love, which are books exploring topics of awareness aimed primarily at children, but are uh, really for all people, all people of all ages. So um, we know that stress, anxiety, and fear are rampant in the world today. And uh, this causes us to feel threatened and to trigger natural responses of protection and survival. Uh, with this situation, we all need to be involved in activities and practices that help balance stress and help bring resiliency to our body, mind, and spirit. Now more than ever, we need to be engaged in practices of going within, of acting, asking ourselves who we truly are, and of connecting to our true nature. One tool to bring balance to our system is through our breath. Maro will explore the many facets of the breath, how it can help decrease stress, regain peace, and be a portal to the sacred now. So um, I'll now turn it over to Mara, Mauro. And if you have questions, again, please send them to uh, Vitold Kreutzer in the chat, and he will compile them for the end of the presentation. So Mauro, it's over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me today. Um, I am coming from uh, Hawaii, and so I am um, outdoors, and so I do not have uh, the ability to control the amount of wind that is present, um, rain or shine, and I do not have the ability to control um, sirens or loud motorcycles that drive by, although I am on the 21st floor. Um, I did think about pre-recording this, but thought that coming in live would be much better. Um, and so I do apologize for any uh, external noise or anything like that that you do um, that you do here. Um, I'm very uh, uh, available for um, questions even after this is done. So uh, if you reach out to Michael uh, and have any questions, um, please feel feel free to do so. Um, I'm honored to be here. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, do you see that as a full screen now? Yes. Just yep. Okay, great, thanks. So um, as uh, my I'm doing the practice, uh, I'm a practicing physician. Um, I run people who are experiencing um, crying, typically. Um, and um, I've come to use the breath uh, extensively. So I wanted to do this presentation on the breath itself. Um, to be clear, what this is not, this is not an attempt to uh, diet um, an illness. Uh, or any medical condition that you may have. Um, it's not what we're here for. 
Uh, it's not a lecture on trauma or trauma resolution. And for any health-related issues, um, if you if you consult your healthcare provider, even though I am a healthcare provider, I'm not here to provide um, diagnoses or treatments. Um, what this is, it is uh, uh, to discuss the effects of stress on the body and mind, um, to discuss research on the use of breath to help bring balance to the nervous system, and to encourage each and every one of you to engage in practice of uh, going uh, within um, to help unveil your true nature, and to consider using the breath as a tool to help build resiliency in that, um, in that process. Stress has actually been classified um, as uh, a health epidemic of the 21st century. Um, there's even a popular HBO uh, documentary, One Nation Under, uh, Under Stress, which is uh, fairly interesting to think about that. The American Psychological Association in 2022 did a stress survey. They do a stress survey every year in uh, America. They pull over as many people as they can. We got 3,000 people um, found that 81% were stressed due to uh, supply chain issues. 87% of people were stressed due to rising inflation, which had increased from 59% in August 2021. So that's an increase, that's a significant increase in uh, stress related to the sort of financial issues. 80% um, stressed about the Russian cyber attacks or nuclear threats. Uh, 69% stress is possible World, world War III. 65% um, of people stress about money and economy. And 66% of people stress that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, will never end, for instance. There's many effects of stress on the human body. Um, this includes things like headaches, uh, difficulty concentrating, uh, irritability, dizziness, uh, memory loss. Um, even heartburn, acid reflux, development of ulcers, uh, decreased absorption of nutrients in the uh, in the GI tract or the gut, uh, diarrhea, constipation, um, rapid breathing, increased heart rate, increased risk of heart disease or uh, heart attacks, increased uh, blood sugar, so a greater propensity for uh, diabetes or insulin resistance. Um, increased blood pressure, increased muscle tension, um, increased risk of depression, anxiety, and uh, insomnia, uh, fertility problems, including erectile dysfunction, decreased libido, changes in, uh, in menstrual cycle, as well as a decreased immune um, system and immune response. So if you uh, do get an infection, you actually, uh, under chronic stress, you have a decreased ability to uh, fight that infection. In order to fully understand um, stress, uh, we'll be talking a lot about the autonomic nervous system. So just to get a fundamental kind of understanding of the autonomic nervous system and how it works, uh, essentially. Um, that the autonomic nervous system is, uh, is, is automatic. It's something that we don't uh, really think about. We don't need to think about. Um, and mostly it's divided into uh, two different nervous systems known as the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, the sympathetic nervous system is what most people would flight response. Um, and the parasympathetic nervous system is what people call rest and digest response, the rest and digest. And so both these nervous systems are extremely important and they're absolutely necessary. The sympathetic nervous system is, uh, is responsible um, for activating uh, automatic responses when, for instance, we do feel stressed or when we do feel threatened. And it's a very appropriate response. Um, evolutionarily, it's a very appropriate response. Um, for instance, if you have, um, you know, if you were being um, attacked by a tiger or a lion or, um, you know, somebody's trying to steal your purse or your wallet, um, you're going to mount a sympathetic response to that. You're going to either try to fight um, or you're going to try to run. 
Um, and so the nervous system, it's not like something that you have to think about. It's something that the nervous system does for itself. So it activates, um, it sends more blood to, for instance, the large muscles um, in the legs and the arms so that you can run, uh, you can fight. Um, it dilates your pupils, for instance, um, so you get more light um, coming into your eyes. Um, and it increases things like uh, your heart rate, because when you increase your heart rate, you're going to get more blood to your system, and um, it decreases flow to your intestines and stomach for digestion of food, which is very appropriate, because if you're trying to um, run away from something, or you're trying to fight something, you don't really need to allocate those resources uh, of the human body to, for instance, digest food. Uh, and so the body sort of does as it itself. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system, we see it as sort of the opposite, is the digest nervous system. So um, this is uh, mostly responsible for uh, relaxing um, our system, resting our system, bringing our system, let's say, back to homeostasis to some degree, as well as helping us when we eat something, digest our food, um, falling asleep so that we can get proper sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see where it goes. So a healthy nervous system has a really nice balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response. And when we get aroused or we get activated, for instance, um, our sympathetic nervous system comes on board and uh, we, we do what we need to do. For instance, we wake up in the morning and we take care of the things that we need to take care of. And then we have breakfast or lunch and then we want the parasympathetic nervous system to come on board and digest our food for instance. And so we digest our food and we can absorb the nutrients appropriately. And we have a really nice balance the, 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 you know, the normal range or um, what you'll see later as a window of, uh, of tolerance. And every one of us, you know, we get, we wake up in the morning, but maybe we need to go to work. We do, do something, we activate our sympathetic nervous system. And then we want that balance. We want a real nice balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, sympathetic and the parasympathetic. This happened over time, though, is that let's say something, some traumatic event has come into the system, and either we're in a, uh, and it happened uh, repetitively, um, and we're either stuck in an on position, or we get outside of our comfort zone, we get outside of this zone of, of tolerance, and we have time uh, 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 decreased, we have a hard time regulating back, we get uh, in a stuck off. Um, we have our time activating, and so any of the uh, any of the symptoms, for instance, of, of stuck on, um, would be a hyper sympathetically driven state, which is anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, um, exaggerated startle, inability to relax, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see those up there? But if you're in a stuck off position, there's things like depression, flat affect, um, lethargy. Um, you sort of feel dead, like you don't want to move, exhaustion, chronic fatigue. And so being being in any of these stuff on or stuff off means that our nervous system um, um, has been sort of, uh, uh, in, 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 let's say, in a state of shock or something like that and has not been able to respond. It hasn't been able to bring resiliency um, back to the system. It hasn't been able to bring homeostasis back to the system. Um, and we, 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 we might have a tendency of sort of being hypervigilant, anxious, and then feeling like we're, you know, we're depressed and flat. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of work that has been done in this. Um, you see her, which is in the middle, where we feel uh, emotionally. And um, it's in... Uh, it's in dashed lines, and this is the zone of this what we call the zone of tolerance, a window of tolerance. Um, things that cause to go out of those windows of tolerance are things like chronic stress, um, traumatic events that may happen. Um, and and when I say you know traumatic event, it might even be uh, listening to the news uh, in regards to let's say COVID or something like that. 
And you can see what happens if you go into that fight or flight sympathetic response, hyper aroused, all the sort of things we've talked about, like anxiety, uh, anger, aggression, rage, uh, addictions, overeating, et cetera, et cetera. Or the freeze response, um, which is hypo aroused, which is um, that 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 feeling of you know depressed, sort of uh, lethargic, um, uh, chronic fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. And they have a very nice um, uh, picture here of well, how do we actually stay in the window of tolerance? And they say you know practicing things like mindfulness, uh, grounding experiences, grounding exercises, um, techniques for self-soothing, deep and slow breathing. So that's what we're mostly going to be talking about. Um, even the uh, National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine from the from the U.S. government has started using these terms of the window of tolerance and hyper arousal, being anxious, angry, out of control. How many of us in the last two years have felt some sort of felt uh, you know some sort of ang ang anxiety or being overwhelmed? Um, and then we have the hyper arousal, uh, the hypo arousal state, which is spacey, zoned out, numb, frozen. And sometimes you can actually go between these states quite rapidly. Uh, and you may have experienced this yourself. And this is essentially um, that we are outside of this window of tolerance, that we are outside of this window of tolerance. And so you can see here that under stress on the left, when stress or trauma, stress or trauma can actually shrink this window of tolerance. And so what I'm here to sort of encourage you all is that this window of tolerance is something that we can actually work on um, actively. We can work on it with a healthcare provider, a therapist, a counselor, um, in terms of actually increasing this window of tolerance so that what happens to us or what we are exposed to in life, we have a greater deal, we have a greater ability of our system to actually be able to um, uh, see it coming, accept it, process it, and and respond, as opposed to either freeze um, or um, you know go into a sort of a hyper vigilant reactive uh, state. That we can actually do practices that help increase this window of tolerance, so that now we're able to cope with everything that happens in. Um, in life. And there are practices that we can do. And so today, what I want to really kind of focus on is, um, is the breath, the breath. Um, it's a very powerful tool um, to help increase your window of tolerance. Um, we take about 26,000 breaths per day. And so, uh, you know, my question is, if we do something so frequently during the day, um, why not use it wisely? Uh, are, are, are we doing it correctly in essence right and um and 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 today if you if you don't have a breath practice sort of like an encouragement to maybe uh, see if you can develop breath practice but it's also an encouragement to sort of watch you know pay attention to um to the research that is coming out um in um in the breath uh, uh, and and i can guarantee you over the next five years there is going to be a ton of research that's going to come out in terms of the breath being able to modulate um, responses in our nervous system, health responses, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to talk about some of those. Here's a few. Um, let me see if we can be able to. Like it sort of disappeared the other night. Um, anyways, so here are just a few um, research articles from PubMed. So PubMed is sort of the um, is 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 you know a government based, government funded um, data uh, for uh, for clinical research for studies that have been performed. Um, and these are just a few studies that have been done in regards to the breath. Uh, 
Sudarshan Kriya Yoga, A Breath of Hope During COVID-19 Pandemic that was published in 2021. Again, um, Sudarshan Fan Yoga Program and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Feasibility Study. So looking at um, can um, Kriya Yoga breath practice actually help in post-traumatic stress disorder? Uh, Sudarshan Kriya Yoga Breathing in the Treatment of Stress, Anxiety, and Depression, Part 1, Neurophysiological Model. Benefits of one session, right? This was done in 2021, September of 2021. Benefits from one session, slow breathing on vagal tone and anxiety in young and old. Folks, right? So there's this big question of, 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 uh, of you know, how much... How much do I have to practice, right? Everyone wants to know. It's sort of like, I have to practice. Um, um, and they showed benefits from just one session of uh, one session of even slow breathing. You're going to see this other term if you're not familiar with it, vagal tone. Um, vagal tone is uh, directly uh, talking about the vagus nerve. Um, and so the vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10. This is the main, um, this is the main nerve that comes down, that comes from, um, from the cranium uh, and comes down and essentially is the main controller of our parasympathetic response. That's the rest and digest response. Remember, so that's the sort of parasympathetic response is that rest and digest. It's sort of the balance of the sympathetic. It's the breaks on the sympathetic response, right? And so when you see the term vagal tone, imagine um, the vagus nerve being like a string on a guitar, for instance. And if, you, uh, if, the, if the string on the guitar is not well tuned, pluck it. Or it's let's say it's 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 limp, right? And you pluck it, it's not gonna make a very good sound. It might go that think, right? If you increase the tone, if you work on actually tuning the vagus nerve or tuning the string on the guitar, you pluck the nerve, and now you have a really good tone, you have a really good um, response that comes from this nerve. And so what you're gonna see is practices that help increase vagal tone increase vagal tone and what you're doing is you are helping increase the ability of the parasympathetic nervous system to come on board come on board okay um here's another one effects of yoga respiratory practice here's a pranayama yoma uh, pranayama practice uh, with brain functional connectivity and activity um this is published in 2020 so literally uh uh, respiratory practices actually changing the um, the firings of neurons in your brain. Um, assessment of the effects of pranayama, uh, alternate nostril breathing on parasympathetic tone um, in young adults. Again, effective alternate nostril breathing um, on experimentally induced anxiety. Um, and if you just go on to PubMed and do a search on alternate nostril breathing, I'm not going to do it, it just for the sake of time. But if you go on to PubMed and do a search for alternate nostril breathing, you'll see all the studies that are being done on the, you know, on the premise of alternate nostril breathing and some of the uh, health uh, benefits that it might uh, that it might actually bring to us. Um, here's another one: um, the physiological effects of slow breathing. This was published in 2017. The physiological effects of slow breathing in the health of human. Um, how breath control can change your life. Published in 2018. A systematic review of psychophysiological correlates of slow breathing. So you start you're starting to see these uh, these themes that people are, are 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 bringing into this practice. Right. Some of them have been uh, alternate nostril breathing. Some of them have been deep and slow breathing. Um, this one specifically in 2018 is looking at the physiological correlates of slow breathing. And so here's this table, just to go over some of the benefits of um, slow breathing, slow breathing. So, to, you know, to be fairly blunt, um, if we had a medication that could do all of this, 
um, we would be prescribing it. We would probably be putting it in our in our drinking water, right? We would be um, we would be advertising it like crazy. Um, but this is the breath. This is the breath. Um, so nobody can own it. Uh, it's not um, anything that you can sell. So in terms of um, from a respiratory perspective, uh, generally coincides with increased tidal volume. So you're able to take take, uh, take more uh, more oxygen uh, into the um, into your uh, lungs. Enhances uh, ventilation efficiency and uh, arterial oxygenation. So you're actually getting by breathing slowly. You're actually uh, increasing the oxygen that is in the blood, all right? Um, it increases venous return, so you're getting more blood coming back to uh, the heart, increasing cardiac output. You get more blood coming back to the heart, you're going to get more blood that the heart is actually pushing. Um, causes blood pressure, pulse fluctuations, synchronized with heartbeat. And this is actually um, uh, an important sort of physiological uh, um, effect. Um, may entrain and enhance vasomotion and microflow to improve blood oxygenation. But increases heart rate variability. HRV is heart rate variability and blood pressure fluctuations. Heart rate variability is a really important concept that you will start, if you're not familiar with it already, um, you will start seeing it come out um, much more frequently in the future. Heart rate variability and vagal tone are probably two of the things that sort of uh, the research um, will open your eyes to. What heart rate variability is, is that at, when we breathe in and we breathe out, when we breathe in and we breathe out, our heart rate actually has a natural um, rhythm to it. It actually has a natural variability that flows with our breathing. Okay. When we breathe in, for instance, our heart rate will go up. When we breathe out, our heart rate will go down. And as I'll talk later, that's actually very closely linked to um, the nervous system, our autonomic, the parasympathetic, and the sympathetic response. What many people have who are stressed is significantly decreased heart rate variability. And why is that? Well, if we have a system that is functioning appropriately, that has resiliency in it, that has this ability to flow, that has this ability to go up when it needs to and come back down when it needs to, go up when it needs to. And uh, you know, you're sort of like a willow branch, it flows with the wind. That's sort of like our system. And that is actually, we can Hello, Mauro. Um, so anyways, so going back to the ability. ability, yes. So we have this ability of, of um, in, 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 in nervous systems that are well balanced, we have this really nice ability of going up and coming down, going up and coming down. Well, most of us um, are in a, uh, a sympathetically driven state. So we, we, we're, we're, we're sort of, if we're always stressed, and we don't actually have this ability to come down. And so what happens is that, that the, um, the heart rate variability, because the parasympathetic nervous system doesn't come on board quickly, there's no resiliency from the parasympathetic nervous system to come on board, you, we start to decrease that heart rate variability. And so this is actually something that we can start to measure in people and see how practices actually start changing the heart rate variability specifically meaning that we are actually starting to train the nervous system. Okay, so that we can actually train, we can actually start training the nervous system out through our breathing. Okay, so 
you increase heart rate variability, you may decrease blood pressure. Um, you, again, augments increases heart rate variability and baroreflex sensitivity. Baroreflex sensitivity is, for instance, if you ever, um, you know, if you're ever lying down and you stand up quickly uh, and you get lightheaded, that's your your baroreflex is what's responsible for 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 regulating that response that you don't pass out, so that you get enough blood flow to your to your, to your head, so you don't pass. Out. Okay. Um, increases um, RSA, which is respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Uh, and what they have found, surprisingly, through all this research, right, is we, you and I, when we're not really thinking about it, we probably breathe about 12 to 18 breaths per minute. What they found is that there is um, a, a six breaths per minute, that there's this resonant frequency of six breaths per minute. Um, where uh, this respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and um, they've actually done MRI studies of the brain when we're breathing at six breaths per minute, and there's greater cohesion. Um, there's uh, better communication between different parts of the brain when we're actually breathing at six breaths per minute. And so if you go on any of these breathing apps, or even online, and you, you know, just go to you, you know, YouTube and look at any one of these breathing apps, you'll see that a lot of them are already pre-programmed to breathe six breaths per minute. And what does that mean? That means that you're taking five seconds to breathe in and five seconds to breathe out. Five seconds in, five seconds out. Five seconds in, five seconds out. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's increased synchronization of pulse harmonics and blood flow and heart rhythm so that when you are actually beating your heart, blood will flow. Um, and this is a big one. So when you look at the autonomic nervous system response, increases vagal activity or vagal tone. Right? Again, this is the vagus nerve is the primary nerve for uh, the parasympathetic response. So you're increasing that, that vagus activity. You're getting a shift towards the parasympathetic dominance. And why is this important? This is important because on average, there's a greater propensity for us to be stressed and for us to be in a sympathetic dominance. That's sympathetically driven. And if we are constantly in a sympathetically driven state, this is going to, as soon as it is living, to start living in that state, we need to bring something on board that helps us regulate. That. So if we're constantly stressed, we're going to be in a sympathetically dominated state. As soon as we bring resiliency to our system, now we come back into the parasympathetic. And so it's not about one being good or bad. It's not about one system. It's not about the sympathetic system being, you know, a good bad system. It's about bringing resiliency and balance to the system. Right? Um, augments vagal power, um, enhances phasic modulation of sympathetic activity. So again, phasic modulation, right? You want the sympathetic activity to be a, a phase response. You don't want the sympathetic activity to be all active. Um, and then in, improves autonomic responses to physical per perturbations like we talked about before, uh, standing, et cetera, et cetera. Right? How breath control can change your life, a systematic review on psychophysiological correlates of slow breathing. Again, we found evidence of increased psychophysiological flexibility um, linking parasympathetic activities related to emotional control and psychological well-being in healthy subjects. Um, this is your breath. This is not a medication that I'm prescribing to you. This is not something that you need to go to the pharmacy to, to pick up. Right? You don't need a prescription for this. Um, in addition, and this is a this is going to become big as well. In addition, um, we found evidence of increased psychophysiological flexibility. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. In addition, the role at nostrils and more specifically the olfactory epithelial play during breathing techniques is not yet well considered nor understood. Evidence from both animal and human models is that the hypothesis that nostril based respiration stimulates some sort of um, mechanoreceptive properties. So when we breathe in, all right, the air actually goes into um, into our uh, our nasal passages, and it comes up and it hits the olfactory. When you when you know, if I'm smelling my coffee, I can inhale that, and it goes up 
and I can, you know, I, I, I can smell the coffee. It goes to a nerve center in my nose. And with breathing, what they're seeing is that, is that by doing nasal breathing, um, there's something that's happening to the brain when we do nasal breathing that's almost in, instantaneous when we breathe nasal. Um, and so pay attention to that as well. As well. Slow nasal breathing linking to psychophysiological effects um, that are profound. Right? A Stanford study um, done in, in 2017, study shows how slow breathing uh, induces uh, tranquility. Uh, here's another one, breath of life. Uh, the respiratory vagal stimulation model of contemplative activity. So again, you're seeing this, how the breath can stimulate and bring balance to the vagus system. Um, a randomized control trial of kundalini yoga and mild cognitive impairment. This was done in 2017. This was actually done out of, uh, out of UCLA. And they did a trial of kundalini yoga, which involved uh, movement, some movement and breath work. Um, and they compared it to their, um, what they call their men enhancement uh, techniques that were um, designed and researched and, you know, all these sort of uh, uh, how to improve your memory. And they actually found that kundalini yoga had a better effect than, than these memory enhancement techniques that these uh, UCLA researchers were, 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 were creating. Um, EEG signatures. So EEG signatures are, uh, are, are, you know, how the brain is, uh, is firing. Um, EEG signatures change during unilateral yogi uh, nasal breathing. Um, so with breathing, you can actually change the, um, this, the, 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 the way that your neurons are firing in your brain. Now, this was done January 2022, ladies and gentlemen, right? This is not... This is, you know, this is fairly recent stuff that people are looking at. Wow, can breathing actually change uh, the way that the brain is firing? Yes. Um, breathing above the brain stem, volitional control and attentional modulation in humans. Uh, this was a neurosurgeon who looked at, um, you know, he had actually put wires into people's brain and looked at um, electrical activity, neurons firing when he was doing brain surgery. And just simply ask them to breathe, pay attention to your breath, and saw what neurons were firing, and then, uh, you know, bringing attention to your breath and saw what neurons were firing. Um, here's an interesting study done in 2020, deep, slow nasal respiration with tight lip closure, um, attenuates with immediate attenuation of severe tics. So they actually did a study on Tourette syndrome, on Tourette syndrome. And what they found, um, you know, it's, if you read the background there, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting, right? Common lesson basic techniques are often unable to attenuate ticks. Um, with deep brain stimulation being the only effective treatment, uh, they did a study where they actually had people uh, breathe deep and slow through the nose for only 120 seconds two minutes. And what they noticed is after two minutes of breathing, people were actually able to decrease their tics, uh for from Fairly Breathing-based meditation intervention for patients with major depression disorder um, following inadequate response to anti antidepressants. So imagine, you know, being put on a breathing protocol after you don't get get a response from three or four antidepressants. Uh, there's a study patient decreases post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms in U.S. military veterans. Randomized control longitudinal uh, and respiratory training as a strategy to prevent cognitive decline in the aging, a randomized control study. Randomized control study. So is, can breathing actually help decrease cognitive decline? Yes, it can. Why, do we, why don't we use it for everyone? Right? And here's um, sort of more, you know, this was June 2022, so it just came out, immediate impact of yogic breathing on pulsatile cerebrospinal fluid uh, dynamics. Um, if, if, if you go to any of my YouTube videos online, you'll see why I'm interested in the cerebrospinal fluid. 
but that there's something that the breath is doing with the pulsatile nature cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is uh, a clear fluid that's in our brain. We are starting to understand how the cerebrospinal fluid is important in cleaning out toxins uh, from the brain based on its movement through sleep. Um, but we're understanding now also how the, 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 the cerebrospinal fluid is moving um, even with the breath doing yogic breathing. The, um, you know, they did uh, spontaneous breathing, slow breathing, uh, deep abdominal breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing, and deep chest breathing. So those were the five breathing protocols that they, um, that they studied in this recent study that just came out in June of 2022, uh, looking at how uh, the breathing practices can actually affect the movement of this cerebrospinal fluid in your spine, in your brain, um, and this pulsatile nature that breathing may actually bring to the cerebrospinal fluid. If you do have any questions um, in terms of connecting the breath to the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid, I have a number of videos on YouTube that discuss that concept. So why am I interested in the breath? Well, it's always with you, okay? Always with you. Um, you don't need to pay anyone for it or wait for someone else. Now, this is a very important thing. If we had a medication that could do everything that the breath could do, it would be, uh, it would be, in, our, it would be in our drink of water, guaranteed, right? Um, what's interesting about the breath is that it, it occurs automatically, so it requires no conscious input uh, at all. But we can also control it consciously. I can ask you to take a deep breath, and you can take a deep breath. I can ask you to hold your breath. You can hold your breath. Um, there's various breathwork practices like pranayama breathing, Wim Hof method, uh, uh, holotropic breathwork, uh, alternate nostril breathing, where we can actually affect. Breath. So we can bring, we can breathe automatically, where we're not changing everything, anything, and we're just noticing the breath, or we can actually change it consciously. Right? Breath is impermanent, so it's a great tool to practice impermanent. This breath. Um, it comes and, and it goes. Because it's impermanent then, we can practice things like acceptance, receptivity, allowance, and letting go. For instance, each breath that comes, we accept it, we allow it, we let it go. This practice of bringing in the breath, accepting it, allowing it to be there and releasing it can also be a model for practice with things like our thoughts, our emotions, our sensations, and then getting to understand the nature of our mind. All right. Um, the experience of each breath is the present moment. Uh, so the breath can be an anchor to the present moment. This breath, just this breath, is an anchor to the present moment. It's an object that we can direct it, our attention to. Uh, for instance, we can notice how we are breathing. We can um, investigate the breath in this moment. We can notice the sensation of the breath in the body. For instance, as a sensation, where do you notice the breath the most? Do you notice it in your nostrils as the air is flowing? Do you notice it in your chest, in your belly, in your whole body? If you don't really notice, you might place a hand on your chest or on your belly and see where do you notice your hand moving. Um, it can also help us develop focus and concentration. You can count the breath one through 10. As your mind wanders, you come back to number one or just simply this breath. You're paying attention. What are you paying attention to? This breath, that's it. So that starts developing focus and concentration of the mind. Uh, you Maro, can pay attention and notice the breath. Excuse me, Maro. I just want to let you know you've got five minutes, approximately. Thank you. Perfect. All right. You can notice the breath cycle starting and ending. Um, you can notice when you start sensing the sensation of the breath. Um, you can notice the pause between breaths. You can whisper a phrase like breathing in, I know I'm breathing in, that Thich Nhat Hanh, um, has used, breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. The breath also has a natural expansion and contraction. So there's a balance of opposites, right? So we're not just expanding, we can't hold the expansion, we need to then contract as well. It's a direct switch to the autonomic nervous system, okay? So it can help balance the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system help bring resiliency to your nervous system to be more adaptable to the environment you're in. And it can help bring balance and homeostasis to your body, mind, and spirit. As we talked about, it directly affects the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid. 
It directly affects your heart rate and your heart rate variability. When you inhale, it increases the heart rate, activating your sympathetic response. And when you exhale, it decreases the heart rate, activating the parasympathetic response. There's many questions in terms of nasal or mouth breathing, and this depends, for instance. Um, if you're doing a breathing technique that involves mouth breathing, and you do that breathing technique. But in general, the benefits of nasal breathing are slowly being understood. Right? This may increase uh, nitric oxide production um, by sixfold. Um, and this can be something that actually can can be enhanced by practicing things like the Ujjayi breath, or some people know it as like the Darth Vader breath, when you when you constrict the back of your throat and you sort of, or the ocean breath, which sounds like if you're underwater and you're breathing like you're underwater, or even humming. Um, you may notice, for instance, in times of stress, you may actually be humming, um, and, and and that's an indicator that you're actually using your breath to decrease your stress, to bring resilience. In. So in times of stress, ask yourself, am I breathing? We tend to hold our breath, right? So, oh my God, I just got this email that is stressful and we don't breathe. So am I breathing? So number one, breathe. Number two, am I breathing shallow or deep? So we tend to breathe shallow when we're stressed. Um, am I breathing with my nose or mouth? We tend to open our mouth and breathe with our mouth. And then how rapid am I breathing? We tend to breathe more rapid, we tend to breathe more rapid, all right? So, uh, if paying attention to your breath is a challenge, then pay attention to something else at first that you feel safer paying attention to. Um, do any practice that resonates with you that makes you feel more relaxed, and then slowly titate, titate the breath um, into your practice. Only if you can, you feel comfortable doing so. Some people pay attention to their breath and they feel anxious immediately, and it's not at this moment, it's not right for you to do something else, right? So the health benefits of the breath are slowly being understood, but have been experienced for millennia. We have, you know, practices from yogis way back um, that have used the breath. It is a direct switch for the autonomic nervous system, as I've discussed. Although no one size fits all, and that's important, when you breathe, first of all, breathe. So try not to hold your breath. Um, use your nose if you can, slow your breath down and take deep, deeper breaths. If you want, extend the exhale a little bit. So you take an in breath of like three or four seconds, and then you just extend the exhale where you're extending it, you know, five, six, seven seconds. Um, and there's a number of apps, uh, that, that can help you with, uh, with counting, count it yourself, et cetera. Um, you have conscious control of it. So like it's a switch, you can actually choose to turn it on. So use it. Um, and uh, you said I've, uh, I had five minutes. Okay. Well, we won't do a practice. Um, I was hoping to get to a practice, but with the, uh, with the, with the internet, uh, I do apologize. Anyways, I do want to, uh, I do want to thank you. I want to thank Michael Bradford for inviting me to the Institute for Consciousness Research. Um, if there's any questions, please practice. I do, um, I do run a, uh, what we call the Awakening Awareness Program um, from the Emerging Science Foundation. And the first six sessions are free, um, all on, on the Brilliano app. And uh, it, it, the first six sessions really kind of go into um, a little bit on the breath and then learning how to titrate if you don't feel comfortable using the breath initially. Um, and if you have any questions, again, I'm available. My website's holdingspace.com. Oh, thank you very much, Maro. Uh, I had no idea. You know, I know about the breath. I know in yoga class we do breathing, and uh, but there's so much more to it, and that's the amazing thing. So I appreciate it. Uh, you inspiring us to be more aware of our breaths and. Uh, to take that in a new direction. So thank you very much. And uh, we are taking a very quick- Oh, uh, Dad? Yep. I, we, can I give a question to uh, Maro from the audience? Uh, we have time for a quick question. Okay. Yeah. Does he have any experience of breath control on himself and what effects on his own health did he witness? Yeah, so mostly actually uh, uh, 
uh, increasing resiliency. So for instance, um, in stressful situations, going through medical school, for instance, and sort of, you know, uh, mostly talking to people about life-threatening diagnoses or things like that, I'd notice myself disassociating. So I'd, I'd notice myself going into that freeze response, the hypo arousal. I almost like, it's sort of like, I, you know, I, I can't do this. Like, I don't have the, I don't have the capacity to hold this. Uh, and, um, and I would notice myself almost disassociating in essence um, and, and, and feeling very lightheaded and dizzy. And in fact, um, I actually passed out once. I felt so lightheaded um, in a, you know, in a, in a stressful situation that uh, I passed out. And, um, and, and immediately um, I was like, okay, you know, I started noticing it as a trend because it was a nervous system response. It was a, it was an immediate nervous system response. And it's not something that I judge myself. It's just like, wow, my nerve, this is what my nervous system is doing. Okay. And then, um, and so I started doing, um, I started doing a lot of um, various breath work, uh, mostly um, slowing down my breath and taking deeper breaths and even going down to, to, you know, to like not six breaths a minute, but like two or three breaths a minute. And there's a lot, there's a lot of physiology around, for instance, um, you know, even when we are anxious or we hyperventilate, you know, the reason why we take a we take a, a, a brown paper bag and put it to our mouth to hyperventilate is not to increase the oxygen in our body, but it's actually to increase the carbon dioxide in the body. Because the carbon dioxide, we're actually, when we breathe so quickly, we're breathing out carbon dioxide. And so there's a lot of physiology that I did not have time to get into. But there's a lot of physiology in terms of balancing the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. And, and again, there's a balance, right? We don't want to hold our breath for too long where we're just saturating ourselves with carbon dioxide. But there is a physiologic response of slightly increasing the carbon dioxide levels in your body by slowing down your breath. And this actually drives oxygen into the tissues. So you might feel like there's a health and vibrancy that comes because what you're doing is you're actually shifting the, the oxygen being delivered to your tissues in your periphery and your fingers. You might feel like, wow, oh, I feel alive. Like there's like a bubbling sensation in here, all driven by your slight changing of the physiology. So I actually started doing that. I stopped dissociating. Um, I stopped getting dizzy. All those, all those, you know, sort of like foggy, dizzy, all those things, like I had a hard time concentrating. You'd be talking to me, couldn't pay attention to you. For instance, I would just out there, uh, as well as, you know, uh, increased uh, blood pressure. Uh, I had hypertension, um, don't have hypertension anymore. Uh, and so, you know, I've noticed it significantly. And then also with my, you know, with my, with my kids, things like that, it's like, the greater ability you know, to take deep breath. Now, you know, it's like if I feel like uh, I feel like flipping out, first thing I do is take a deep breath. For instance, right? Take a deep breath, press. And I extend the exhale. There's a, there's, a, there's a physiologic reason for that too. But if you just think of, you know, taking a sigh or humming, um, if, you, if you take an inhale and hum, you can that you like but you're extending you're actually naturally when you hum you're actually naturally extending the exhale and if you remember the exhale is actually linked to the parasympathetic nervous system so you're you're even shifting that dynamic a little bit but we do this naturally and it's just a matter of like bringing awareness to you like oh wow you know like when i feel stressed I'm like humming to myself or, uh, you know, or whatever it is. Um, uh, so I guess that was an extended answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mara.